Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be We Need to Talk, Marriage Counseling with Capitalism Itself. I'd like to welcome Reese Lindmark to the virtual stage to begin our session. Sweet. Hello, everybody. Thank you for doing all the logistics, um, everybody on the back end. It's awesome. It's kind of cool to be here on a virtual stage. I will accept your applause virtually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm in my bedroom. Uh, it's 10 p.m. here. Uh, so wherever you are in the world, I hope you're doing well, whether you're about to awake or about to sleep. Um, and yeah, as uh, they noted, I'm going to be talking about capitalism and a marriage counseling se session. And so I'm gonna start by sharing my screen um, and we'll kind of just dive into it. Uh, so let's rock and roll. Um, so the high level idea here is that humanity is in this tough, interesting spot where we are, um, we're not sure if our relationship with capitalism is that good. Um, and we're excited by, but also confused by maybe this new thing called post-capitalism, but we don't really know what it is. Uh, so I wrote this piece recently that was kind of looking at uh, that tension. And so we'll kind of dive into that piece today and hopefully by the end clarify what post-capitalism means. So before that, let me just say, hey, I'm Reese. Um, I help ambitious frontier people understand systems. Um, I'm helping out with the Bento Society and the Center for Paradigm Change. I used to work at the MIT Media Labs, Digital Currency Initiative, doing blockchain ethics work. I have a podcast called The Reese 3 Show, uh, which has a bunch of plays and I self-tax my income. Um, yeah, so today we're going to do about 40 minutes of a talk and then 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you have any questions, just start leaving them in the chat uh, now as we go through. Questions, comments, concerns, whatever you have. Um, and we'll start with these kind of high-level overviews of like our shared struggle right now, which I kind of outlined at the beginning, um, and then a little bit on like post-capitalism as a mindset. And then we'll kind of dive into those four key parts of the mindset here of the networkism, coherent pluralism, bentoism, and generosity. Um, so. Yeah, at the beginning here, what's this shared struggle that humanity has? Well, it's capitalism versus post-capitalism. And you can kind of imagine it in this therapy form where you have this therapist on the right and then you have humanity in green and capitalism on the left and then post-capitalism on the right. And these were illustrations done by my friend Audra uh, for my, this recent piece. And so, yeah, there's this tough time for humanity right now um, and they're not sure what to do next. And as a reminder, um, here's humanity, you know, saying what the issue is, um, they say, this is a bit scary for me to say, uh, but I'm not sure about my relationship with either of you, cap or post-cap, capitalism or post-capitalism. Cap, I'm not sure I love you anymore. And post-cap, I barely even know you. And I've been burned on non-capitalist relationships before, so I'm a bit scared. So that's kind of the, the situation we're in right now as humanity. Um, and as a reminder, we've done this before, right? We've uh, the Feudalism existed before capitalism. Lots of things existed before capitalism. And so we can switch and we can change and see what's next. Um, so... As I said, the problem, and when you break it down, is that capitalism doesn't really understand these new digital networks that we have. They don't really understand this like a narrative for the 21st century. They don't have a clear narrative. They don't understand our new long-term needs like climate change. Um, and they don't understand these new concepts of abundance, especially abundance of money. Um, but again, the issue is post-capitalism doesn't really have a plan either. Um, so post -cap or so capitalism isn't working and post-capitalism is unclear. So the goal of this talk is to clarify post-capitalism with those four um, sub points. And I want to say before we go into that, I don't really care if you use post-capitalism as a term. Um, as humanity says here, you can co-create shared stories for a positive future. I don't care whether we call it capitalism or post-capitalism or the thing that happens after we grow the bleep up or whatever. Um, so I'm just going to use the term post-capitalism here. Um, and as another reminder, post-capitalism is a mindset. And what do I mean by this? Well, here's again some dialogue between the characters where they explore this. On first, capitalism says wait a second, when are we gonna talk about economics? Isn't post-capitalism a new kind of economics, like Bitcoin or something? And post-capitalism is like, yeah, Bitcoin. And humanity's like, ah, is Bitcoin the only thing the two of you agree on? And then the therapist, always rational, comes and says, as cool as Bitcoin is, post-capitalism is a mindset, not an economic system. Um, so what do I mean by this? Well, within radical exchange, um, you have all of these like sub pieces of, um, just my screen for a second. Um, you have all these things that you all are exploring or exploring with quadratic finance, quadratic voting, costs, also, et cetera. They always use kind of like markets and incentives to shape behavior, but they're not like the mindset itself, right? They are produced by a mindset, but they are not the mindset. Um, the way I like to think of this is from this professor at Harvard, Lawrence Lessig, who did creative Commons stuff. And he thinks about these four different forces that can shape us. And they are markets, laws, 
norms and code and all those things can kind of shape us um, in, in our radical exchange. We think a lot about markets, um, but those things are produced by a mindset. They're not the mindset in and of itself. So that's kind of what I mean here by post-capitalism as a mindset, not an explicit, it's not like a specific law or specific norm or something like that. Um, so yeah, let's dive into these four big pieces um, and start to explain them. So they are, uh, as I said before, networkism, coherent pluralism, uh, generosity, and bentoism. And let's look at each of them for a second. Networkism is kind of an ontology, um, which means like what is happening, like what's true in the world. And what is happening, as we all know, is that we have this new thing called computers, or this new thing called the internet, and that's drastically changing how society works. So that's um, a big new um, change. The other thing is coherent pluralism, which is a uh, epistemology, which is this question of how do we know things? Um, and so coherent pluralism says, hey, we should, uh, in a networked sense-making environment where there's all this stuff on the internet, um, you have to take in lots of plural, uh, you have to take in lots of different sources and perspectives and then create coherence among them. Um, this third idea is bentoism. is really a question about ethics. It's saying, well, what is good in the world? And bentoism kind of says, hey, it's this you know, cute little two by two that says, hey, instead of only focusing on the bottom left corner here, this now me perspective, we can also focus on future us, this top right perspective and these other perspectives and things like climate change. Um, and then finally, this perspective here of generosity, um, which is specifically this idea that we're in society, we're all starting to get enough, uh, especially um, some folks in the developed world, uh, and we can start to give our abundance and generosity back from uh, to, to help each other and to help future us in climate change. So uh, let's go and dive into each of those more specifically. So networkism. Um, networkism is this idea that we're switching from these centralized institutions like nation states and companies and religions and what have you towards these new weird digitally first um, internet decentralized institutions um, or networks as they're often called. Google, Amazon, Facebook are here, Wikipedia is here. Um, of course, all the sharing economy platforms, Lyft, Uber, et cetera, Airbnb, and then also stuff like um, hashtags like Black Lives Matter. Um, and so these networks are very powerful and you can kind of see in these funny tweets um, how they're kind of uh, replacing some of the, our things in society. Uh, in this top left one, this woman says, hey, uh, the quote tweet says, people are calling Uber to be taken to the emergency room instead of ambulances. Ah, that's weird. Uh, well, why? Well, it's because an Uber ride is a lot cheaper than an ambulance. Um, or, you know, this guy Lon says, so how long until GoFundMe is our nation's leading healthcare provider? Yeah, it's not the best thing, but it's a sign of these, the power of these new networks. Um, and then Jonathan Zittrain from Harvard, um, he says, uh, there's this quote, this tweet that's, what if public infrastructure was funded by the crowd? Wow, wouldn't that be crazy? Um, this is this new crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, and he kind of joking and saying, well, or as some would call it taxes, like that's what we used to call it. Um, so this idea of networkism, I represent it in this, uh, in my piece that I'm, that I wrote this therapy piece through these VR scenes where the, each of the characters puts on a VR headset and like understands this, the concept, this new mindset through a VR. And so the first VR here to understand networkism is this kind of battle between on the bottom here, you have, um, and let me actually add this pointer up, oh, beautiful. Um, on the bottom you have, uh, red is the centralized institutions and blue is this bottom up, you know, networked institutions. And they're kind of battling right now over power, you know, like Google, Amazon, Facebook, et cetera, are battling with existing companies and nation states, et cetera, for power. Um, and so they're going to do this for a while. And, um, and then eventually the hope is that it kind of turns into a dance where they, it's not like one needs to win over the other, but rather they kind of um, are better at some things than other things. And they kind of help each other to, to help humanity. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind this VR piece. And I want to give some specific examples of networkism with our response to COVID, our response to George Floyd and radical exchange. And as a note, we're gonna do these examples with all four of the things. So when we look at um, coherent pluralism next, for example, we'll look at COVID, George Floyd and RxC and coherent pluralism. Um, so networkism uh, and COVID, uh, let's look at it. So from an information ecosystem perspective, these networks, it's been a really big difference with the media on one side versus these networked influencers on the other side. Um, and this was a big piece that came out about, hey, what went wrong with the media's coronavirus coverage? You know, there are a lot of folks that were saying it's not a big deal, also don't wear masks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while the network, what it was doing in, in this image is from Ben Thompson from Stratechery. He's saying, hey, now that you can, now that we have a zero marginal cost of sending and distributing information around the world, um, there's lots more information. And what that means is that there's going to be misinformation on the left, but also valuable information on the right. And because you have so much information, well, if you 
are good at doing the sense making, then you can find the valuable information. That's kind of an example of this. You can also look at it from an institutional perspective with like companies versus networked organizations. And the example here is on the left, you have 3M, a company that makes masks and they're, you know, they're making 25 million masks a week. They, they definitely ramped up their production. It's good. Um, and they've been around for a hundred or so years. And you have this weird new network based organization called open source COVID medical supplies, which is just like a Facebook group of hundred thousand members. And they're actually making a million masks per week. Excuse me, which is a lot um, and not as much, but it's still a lot. But it was only founded a couple months ago. Um, and the other weird thing here is that 3D printing and like Facebook barely even existed 10 years ago. So these are some of these proto examples of these new networked uh, institutions. Um, another example of this is the hashtag masks for all thing. I was asking on Twitter, hey, did masks for all actually have an impact on the CDC's announcement to like say, hey, people use masks. Um, and I was like, eh, probably not. More likely CDC made a decision without thinking about the hashtag slash movement. Um, but then this guy who's leading masks for all, Jeremy Howard says, actually it did. I have firsthand knowledge. So like the hashtag had an impact on like the CDC, which is weird. Um, we can also see networkism in our response to George Floyd. Um, from an information perspective, um, networks are really good at shining a spotlight, right? We can now send and receive information in the censorship resistant way. Um, and as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said after uh, George Floyd's shooting, he said, shooting, sorry, murder, death, what have you. Um, he said, um, African-Americans have been living in a burning building for many years, choking on the smoke as the flames burn closer and closer. Racism in America is like dust in the air. It seems invisible, even if you're choking on it until you let the sun in, then you see that it's everywhere. As long as we keep shining that light, we have a chance of cleaning it wherever it lands. But we have to stay vigilant because it's always still in the air. It's this idea that like racism is around us, but then if we shine light on it, then you can see actually what's happening. And you can see that obviously with um, you know these videos, these smartphone videos of, of George Floyd on the right. And then this one on the left was the video of um, is shot by a camcorder of Rodney King in 1992. So we're getting more light shining essentially. Um, and we're also seeing it with these, all the videos of the protester, police violence against protesters. This is a thread of you know, 350 videos of police violence. Um, so you can also, in addition to the information perspective, you can also see from an institutional perspective, again, companies versus network orgs. And remember, Black Lives Matter is crazy. It's a hashtag. Um, and now it's this massive movement. Um, and then this movement is, yeah, there's, you know, this, these beautiful um, uh, Black Lives Matter murals all around the world now, um, you know, in cities all around the world that are a sign of this movement. So again, it's, it's this crazy hashtag. And, um, you know, you can think what is more impactful today, um, the NAACP or Black, hashtag Black Lives Matter? I don't know the right answer to that, but it's interesting to think of these network first hashtags as very powerful um, uh, movers in our society. Um, finally, we can think of networks and RxC and quadratic financing is the, um, the easiest one here. And so from a centralized perspective, you can think of this as, you know, when COVID happened, the central, uh, the US federal government was like, okay, let's give a bunch of money to people. And they said, okay, for every, and you could kind of, it's very this top down kind of a way um, where essentially you can just represent it in pseudo code where you say, okay, for every person, give them 1200 bucks essentially. Um, and also for every small, medium business, eh, if they pay their staff, give them 10 million bucks. And then for every state, uh, divide $340 billion based off of that state's population compared to the rest of the US population. Uh, finally, let's give the hospitals a billion, a hundred billion bucks, the airlines 60 billion bucks, and then add, you know, 454 billion bucks to the federal account that then you can loan out at 10x to these big businesses. That's essentially what the federal package was. Um, and that's very different than this kind of bottom up network first approach with something like um, liberal radicalism or quadratic financing, where, you know, in round five of the Gitcoin grants, you say, okay, we're going to have a bunch of these different options here. People are gonna signal which ones they like more or less based off of their money. And they're gonna use the money as the actual signaling. And then we're gonna use this kind of optimal matching system to allocate um, the matching treasury to these uh, these groups. So that's really a network first networkism perspective versus this kind of top-down perspective. Um, so that is networkism. Uh, now let's look at, and it's kind of what's happening. That's you know ontologically speaking what's happening. Now let's look at coherent pluralism. And by the way, let me pause for a second. I know this is a lot of information pretty quickly um, and I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> but I understand I'm speaking quickly and trying to get through stuff. Um, so coherent pluralism is um, epistemology. It's like, how do we know what is true in society? Um, and coherent pluralism, the idea again is this beautiful picture where it's like, okay, you're putting on these different lenses and you're saying that this plural amount of lenses, um, but also trying to still have coherence among them. 
And you can kind of imagine it from a developmental perspective. This is a Keegan or Robert Keegan perspective where you say of adult development, where as a kid, you're kind of given lenses. You know, you grow up and you're given these lenses. And you're like, this is what society is like. You're kind of socialized, you're institutionalized by your parents and by society. And then when you start to grow up, you're like, oh my God, I was wearing these lenses. This is crazy. You start to realize that how you were seeing society is not just always true, but you actually have a lens. You can see your lens as an object. Um, and then finally you get to this you know, third stage here where you can kind of put on different lenses and you can be like, oh, what about, is this true? Or what is that true or whatever? Um, this is kind of like the adult development um, to coherent pluralism, which is on the far right. You can also think of it from like a macro cultural perspective where you think of modernism back in the day where it's just like, here's the truth. Let's broadcast the truth, nationalism, et cetera, through the radio, through TV, through these broadcast mechanisms. Um, and it was very clear. It was one perspective. Here's the truth. Here's modernism. Postmodernism is roughly the idea where you're like, oh, man, there's so many perspectives. There is no truth. Um, and this is also kind of embodying the idea of fake news where you're like, OK, if there's so many different options, what is real anymore? Um, you know, the post-truth reality. And of course we don't want that. We want this kind of meta, what's called metamodernism um, or coherent pluralism where you have multiple different perspectives, but then you take them uh, into account and try to create a coherence among those pluralistic perspectives. Um, so yeah, coherent pluralism is how responsible individuals do sense-making given networkism. Again, it's given the fact that we have, that you can consume whatever you want from the internet at any time, you've got to be, you have to take responsibility and you can't just like consume from one source. You have to actively um, curate your feed and, and try to consume from as many sources as possible while still creating coherence among them. Um, so yeah, you can think about it with something like COVID where it's like, you know, the, the modernist perspective might just be like, okay, consume from centralized media, but that's not good because they were telling you COVID doesn't exist and don't wear masks. Um, the non-centralized uh, media is like, oh, you could take this perspective where you're just like, oh, here's all this information. Here's all this valuable stuff. Here's all this non-valuable stuff. Who, who even knows what's real? It's all fake news. That's obviously not correct either. Um, the third correct perspective is to, to actively search for this valuable information on the right. Um, so yeah, let's talk about some examples. Um, with COVID, I just want to highlight this thing from 538. This is right around the times of masks becoming more of a thing. Um, and Maggie really, you know, it has this great quote, which really epitomizes um, the coherent pluralism. She says, ultimately, the expert advice on masks is to get comfortable with not knowing the right answer. You can and should have some trusted advisors. You can and should read up on why certain things are or are not being recommended. But there are a lot of issues around this virus on which two experts can read the same data and come to different conclusions. For the rest of us, excuse me, that means accepting that sometimes we'll just have to do the best we can without a clear set of instructions. This is coherent pluralism. It's just like, look, try to do some trusted stuff um, and do your best, but it's going to be uncertain. <laughs> Good luck. Um, so that is uh, with COVID. With George Floyd, we've seen it. This was um, a, a meme that was going around that I saw, which I agree with some of it and don't agree with all of it, but the idea is a coherently plural perspective where you have these four different ideas um, and you can kind of believe all of them at once and that's okay. It's kind of a yes and perspective. You can both believe that George Floyd's death was a murder and the cops responsible should be put in jail. You can believe that mass protests and civil disruptions are legitimate and warranted actions. You can also believe that looting and burning businesses is immoral. I don't know if immoral is correct, but is not good <laughs> and counterproductive. Um, and people who should do this should go to jail. And you can believe that, that the police system is structurally corrupt and regularly refuses to prosecute cops. So this is again, a plural, uh, hopefully more pluralistic perspective where you can believe these multiple different things. Um, and finally, within our within radical exchange, again, this is like a key example of coherent pluralism. It's just like a very key thing where you're like, okay, you shouldn't just look at all these different um, uh, funding sources coming from a bunch of these random different people and say, okay, we're just going to match them all one to one. That's like that's not that much coherence there. Um, you could do a better coherence job of saying, okay, let's uh, you know match them with this kind of more optimal matching mechanism. Um, and so it's, yeah, something like quadratic financing really takes a pluralistic perspective um, and kind of a network first perspective, but also creates coherence among it and says, hey, we can actually um, uh, allocate this matching treasury in a close to optimal way. Um, and as another note, the radical exchange movement has always kind of had coherent pluralism as a part of it. These were some tweets that I had from, from last year's in-person conference. Um, where Glenn was saying, hey, we didn't expect any of this. There's a lot of folks, um, but we're still falling short. Um, and he says, hey, there's so many different dimensions on inclusion. We don't have as many folks from the global south or rural areas, how to include them. So there's always this constant vibe to try to get more people into the, the, the tent, a big tent. Um, or as Vitalik said in his talk, 
he was saying, hey, here are some common threads between radical exchange and crypto. And the third one is this word that uh, Vitalik and Glenn and um, Daniel Allen use a lot to describe this, um, which is polypolitanism, which is a, a, roughly speaking, a coherently plural perspective where you say, hey, let's think from all these different identities and perspectives at once. Um, so yeah, so it's been part of the, the movement for a while. Okay, so that is coherent pluralism. Let's chat about bentoism and let me do a quick time check here. Okay, about 20 minutes left. Again, if you have any questions on any of the above that we've, we've discussed, please put them in the chat. Um, okay, so bentoism. Bentoism, um, remember that networkism is, was about like what is happening ontologically speaking, what are the kind of the socio-technical systems in society. Um, Coherent pluralism was the epistemological perspective where you say, okay, how do we know what is happening? Um, and, you, and then bentoism is kind of this ethical perspective. It's asking what is good? Um, so the way to understand this is, I like to think of it from first from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, something that could be good is meeting all these needs. Um, you can kind of think about these needs as, as one side of things, but you can also think about these emotions and these feelings. This is from the great Pixar movie, Inside Out, where you have inside yourself, you have these different emotions that can kind of speak to you. You know, joy is telling you, oh, I feel like, you know, I feel happy. While fear is like, hey, I'm scared of that. Um, they're each kind of talking to you, uh, kind of like these little people on your shoulder. And in a similar way, you can do that with um, this little bento box. And so the bento box um, is, for, is for needs, not for feelings. Um, so it's kind of like the Maslow's hierarchy, but it puts us in this nice little two by two. And it's from this book by Yancey Strickler called This Could Be Our Future, a great book, recommend it. And the idea is that in the bottom left corner, we have our now me needs. These are our basic needs uh, like food and water and safety. Um, and here in this corner, we have our future me needs, which are our needs for meaning and mastery and purpose and things like that, how our future me would think about stuff. Um, and then you also have up here our now us needs. And these are our needs for connection, you know, there are needs for you know, yeah, connection with the folks around us. And then finally, you have these future us needs. And these are needs for like resilience and sustainability, um, our kids and our generations and future humanity stuff. So I just love this. It's a very, very simple way, a uh, very simple UI or framework or mindset that allows you to say, okay, um, what are the needs of society? Um, and what are the needs of myself and the needs of others around me? And so you kind of like with that, um, uh, you could, so this is um, this, another picture from my, the piece that says, okay, humanity, you can kind of look inside humanity. Remember the green stuff is humanity. And just like in the movie Inside Out, you can kind of look inside yourself and see these feelings and have them speak to you. So too, can you look inside yourself and see your now me and your future me and your now us and your future us. You can kind of have, we all have these kind of um, little voices in our head that can tell us what we need um, in society and what society needs. Um, and so the other thing here is that Bentoism is both a mindset that uh, that there is this two by two, but it's also this idea that like right now we've been pr way too focused on this now me kind of short term returns piece. Um, and we should really switch more to this kind of a more holistic view on society, thinking about things like our community and our future and, you know, um, climate change and stuff like that. Um, so let's give some examples of Bentoism uh, with COVID. Yeah, we saw this loud and clear. I mean, you obviously saw with now me, people were buying toilet paper. You know, that was, <laughs> that's now me, now that's a need number one. And also we saw it with, uh, I don't know the current date on this, but people were saying, hey, we're going to have these massive um, disruptions in supply chains and, you know, shutdown and stuff like that. And so we're going to go from 800 million people who are hungry up to 1.6 billion people. Um, those are some intense now me needs that are not being met. We also have these future me needs that, uh, everybody like had COVID happen to them and they're like, oh man, I had this plan for my life. Now I don't know what to do. Um, and so, you know, our needs for meaning are kind of confused right now. Uh, we also had these now us kind of needs and these are really our needs that showed us how connected and how hyper-connected we were to everybody. Um, you know, showing us, hey, here's the, the epidemiological view of society essentially. Um, and then similarly with future us, we were able to say, hey, um, there is this uh, flatten the curve is an idea directly from future us where it's like, hey, you're, this is not going to help. This is going to help us now, but it's especially going to happen in the weeks and coming months where we need to make sure our hospital systems don't get overloaded. Um, so that's what happened with COVID. And also the nice thing with um, bentoism is that 
just like with this, how you're kind of shifting uh, the needs and how society kind of shift. Um, we saw that with society shifting towards like making a lot of tests, you know, um, six months ago, we were making zero COVID tests. And now, you know, we're making, I know just last week, the United States made, you know, 3 million COVID tests or had 3 million COVID tests. Um, so 1% of America was tested last week. So that's a sign that we can kind of shift our needs. Um, Similarly, this is the S&P 500. The stock market went down and now it's going back up because it's not connected to reality at all. But um, the hope is that instead of just this kind of V-based um, recovery, we want to also think about the Z-axis here. Um, and on the Z-axis, the hope is that as we do this recovery, we kind of think more about future us and we have this green stimulus, what people might call the green stimulus um, to rebuild our economy, where as stuff gets built back up, we don't just wanna keep doing things the same way. We want to like transition to a new normal where we care about climate change. Um, so yeah, that's the idea. COVID is the first boss and climate change is the second. This is not a graph of um, COVID uh, cases or deaths. This is a graph of climate of CO2 levels. So we're gonna have to deal with that sometime. Um, now let's look at uh, George Floyd. And yeah, I mean, we saw a, the now me side here is that we have this 15% unemployment rate. And so people are, are, um, are angry and they're, they're, a lot of their now me needs are not being met, uh, which is very sad. There's also this need for safety that's not being met where it's one in a thousand black men are killed by police. That's crazy. That's really scary. Um, and so we have this, you know, these protesters being the language of the unheard that these people want these now me needs to be met. Um, from a future me perspective, we can imagine what our older, wiser self will tell us here. Um, and you could think of in 1820, it was okay, you know, as Jefferson, Jefferson said in 1820, slavery is a necessary evil. And in 1940, uh, we had the things, oh, this is separate but equal. So you can think, well, what are we saying now that in 30 years or in 100 years, we're going to look back on ourselves and be like, oh, God, that was not great. Um, so as an example here, our 2050 selves would really, really want us to be anti-racist, to be actively taking um, a stand against this. Um, and then this now us perspective is like, what does us mean here? We're starting to evaluate and say, okay, thinking about things like, okay, getting in Black Lives Matter and Native Lives Matter. And then there are some tensions obviously around adding in these All Lives Matter or thinking about Global South Lives Matter. And so we're really starting to connect with our kind of, our, our the now us side of us. Um, and then this future us perspective, Obviously, it would be great if in the, you know, the extreme version here is this prison police abolition. Um, but there's also a beautiful future us version here where you can imagine that our needs are for safety are still met. Um, but the prison and the police are kind of abolished and are kind of put into mental health structures and things like that in society. Um, the other key thing that George Floyd shows us is that there's a past. <laughs> um, there's past me and there's past us. And, you know, we had slavery in America for 250 years. We had the Jim Crow era. We had redlining, we have mass incarceration. So those things have a, a clear impact on, um, uh, on society today. So uh, finally, let's talk about radical exchange. Um, and instead of quadratic financing, here's the you know, cost, the common ownership self-assessed tax, aka harbinger tax. I'm not sure when that changed name, but whatever. Um, in any case, the, uh, the idea here is kind of blending um, the cost actively you know, breaks this idea of private property and starts to explore these ideas of collective ownership. It's actively forcing individuals when they buy a piece of land or get a piece of thing to say, wait a second, by me owning this, this is directly having externalities or you know, impacts on the rest of society. It's actively telling us to zoom out from our now me perspective and to think about the future um, and each other. Uh, so with that, that is Bentoism. Okay, let's talk about this final one, generosity and abundance. We'll mostly focus on generosity. Um, and the idea here, is that, um, yeah, we're getting to this place where things are more abundant in the VR scene in my piece. Um, they go on this beautiful walk where they walk around and they say, ah, like things are kind of abundant now in a variety of ways. Um, excuse me, there are these beautiful little free libraries where you can just go and like get free books and just take them. Um, you know, you can walk around the street and they're just like fruit trees and lemon trees around. Um, there's like, if you go on Craigslist, there's all these free, there's just free stuff on Craigslist all over the place. Um, and so we're at this, and you can imagine going deeper into the future um, where money just kind of is flowing to you if you want it. Um, that's the hope. And I think we are transitioning towards that. So that's this kind of new abundance view. And you know, we're at this point where we can ex actually experience what I call like now me overflow, um, where you're experiencing this abundance. And what this means is from an individual perspective, it's, this is a graph of income versus happiness, essentially. And this is a log 
based income, by the way, and right around at $45,000 a year, um, these different kinds of happiness, you know, how stress you, how stress free you feel, how not blue you feel, how positive you feel, they are super leveled out right around 45,000. So this is essentially saying, um, we've already known that money has diminishing returns on happiness, but it really starts to level out at 40, after $45,000 a year. Um, and so we're actually feeling abundance here where more money doesn't make you happier, which is crazy. Um, well, from a macro perspective, obviously this is uh, a classic graph from our world and data. And you know, it shows, hey, with child mortality as an example here, bottom right, it's like you know, 200 years ago, half of kids used to die before the age of five, and now it's less than 5%. Things have gotten a lot, a lot better. We still have a lot of work to do, but um, we're getting and moving towards this place of abundance. Um, so let's talk about, uh, in, in the generosity piece is that you can use your own abundance to then give back to others and give back to the system and to climate change and to, to help other people. It doesn't affect your happiness. It just, it's a win-win situation. It makes you, it solves your need for self-actualization while also helping other people meet their needs. Um, so with that in COVID, yeah, we saw this generosity. I mean, one of them was letting the money flow through you. And so the idea here was um, with give directly, they had this hashtag, pass the check. Uh, and there's another one called hashtag split the check. Um, there were a couple of these. And with Give Directly, last time I checked, it was about a thousand folks that pledged to pass the check on uh, for a total of roughly a million bucks. Um, this, these are the checks in the US where everybody's getting 1200 bucks. And obviously it's not like a million dollars is not that much money. But again, I don't, when we had the 2008 uh, checks, we didn't see that, we didn't see this that much. Um, now though, we're actively seeing it. And as a reminder, the hashtag itself had just been invented in 2007. And so again, these are just proto examples, but we're starting to see people say, oh, I'm getting this money from the system. Let me just pass it through back to others who might need it more. Um, so that's an example of generosity and abundance. Also with George Floyd, the key idea here that, I'm, that we're seeing more and more is instead of just like um, educating ourselves, um, you know, for like the, the, the white silence education piece here, um, we're trying to, this, this idea of anti-racism, where you actively want to say, you actually act, have to take action. Um, this can be through money, this can be through other means, but I really have seen through my Facebook feed and a variety of things, people actively taking this like, hey, I'm gonna be matching donations. I'm gonna be giving a lot of money. And we're seeing that a lot more than we did in the past, um, partially because of uh, the cultural mode, but partially because people have enough and they can start to give back um, to fight things like racism. Um, and then finally with radical exchange, at a base level, something like quadratic funding, it just, it requires abundance and generosity. It requires a matching treasury of Vitalik or Ethereum Foundation or whatever um, to be the backing. And it requires these, um, these donors to actually give the money. So, you know, if you're trying to create this little box here, you need the people to give the money in the boxes and you have to have someone to be on the other side to, to give this, this full piece. So this is a way that uh, we can fund these civil society public goods, um, but it requires some of this abundance to get a kickstart at the beginning. Okay. So that is generosity. And so those are our four key points. Um, and as, and I just want to say, um, yeah, you can just to bring us back to the beginning here and we have about, yeah, nice. Um, we have about eight, seven ish minutes left, um, before we go to the Q and A mode. The idea here again is that you have humanity. Humanity is confused. Um, humanity's dating capitalism and been married to capitalism for a while, but it's not really sure if they're right. And is thinking about post-capitalism, but it's not really clear about what post-capitalism is. Um, so capitalism isn't working, but post-capitalism is unclear. And again, I hope that this talk has helped clarify this idea of post-capitalism to you, um, that A, it's a mindset, not an economic system. It's not like post-capitalism is just Ethereum or just Bitcoin or just some of these new economic systems. No, it's an actual mindset that is then manifest in some of these other systems. And the key parts of that mindset, there are four key parts of it. The first one is this idea of networkism, which is this you know, shift to these uh, in institutions from these centralized trusted institutions to these bottom up digital first um, decentralized networks. And again, that's like an ontological perspective on what is true, what is happening in the world is this kind of big socio-technical shift here. The coherent, coherent pluralism is the next key mindset. And it's the idea that um, in a network sense-making environment, you have to uh, be pluralistic with your viewpoints. You have to consume you know, the, your red feed, your blue feed, et cetera, but also create coherence among them. You can't just you know, say things are fake news. Um, so this is again, an uh, epistemological perspective where you're saying, hey, how do we know what is true? Well, you know it from the network by consuming lots of different things. Um, finally, 
And there's this idea of bento, or not finally, but third, there's this idea of bentoism, which is an ethical perspective saying, what is good? And saying, instead of just now me being good and only self-interest, if you help yourself, it'll help everybody else. No, it's kind of zooming out and saying, well, let's think about a future me. Let's think about now us. Let's think about future us. Let's think about our needs and society's needs and actively take those into account when we make decisions. Um, so that's the third piece. And then the final piece here is generosity. And generosity is kind of a specific form of, of uh, yeah, it, it, generosity is the idea that um, our now me bucket for many of us, um, you know, the future is not evenly distributed, but for some of us, we are experiencing that abundance after $50,000 a year, and we can actively use that money to give back to the system in a variety of ways. Um, so we can be generous. So those are the key ideas. And I want to conclude by saying, kind of this scary piece here, and I'm just going to essentially read from humanity. Um, humanity says, mm, and this is at the very conclusion of my piece. So humanity says, this has got me thinking. So much of reality is determined by the mindset that we view it through. And well, mm, close his eyes, that you too, capitalism and post-capitalism, you're just mindsets. In the end, capitalism is just a shared story. It's a shared myth, a shared language we use to describe a shared web of connected concepts. And this is true about post-capitalism post as well. In the end, I can make you two go away. That's actually closer to reality. Even the idea of me, of humanity, that's just a metaphor. I am not actually a thing that spans the entire earth. There's just you, the reader, or here, the listener, sitting at home and reading this on a screen alone. That's what it feels like. You're alone. You're alone and completely insignificant. That's scary. And that's okay. But these four underlying primitives do matter. Recognize we're all interconnected. Think about your needs, help yourself, and help others. That's the idea of bentoism. Recognize that you may have enough. Give to others. You don't need to win. That's the idea of generosity. Be curious. Explore your own mind and try to understand others. That's the idea of coherent pluralism. Appreciate our new socio-technical moment. Look to update our existing institutions while building new ones. Networkism. And even though you're alone, you can co-create these shared stories for a positive future. And again, I don't care whether we call it capitalism or post-capitalism or the thing that happens after we grow the, the hell up or whatever. But I hope that you strive for immense progress while celebrating the small wins. Thanks for reading and good luck. And so you have this beautiful thing where everybody, even though they're just these shared myths and everybody's on their phones watching this or viewing that, um, we can actually co-create these shared stories together uh, and co-create this positive future. Uh, so with that, thank you so much. Um, thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to Twitter uh, and follow me at Rieslamark on Twitter. Um, go to rieslamark.com. Feel free to contact me on there. Uh, join my newsletter or some of the other writings I'm doing about a bunch of these different things. Or join bentoism.org. Um, we have these great uh, weekly bentos that are happening that are really helping people find coherence in their own life and kind of using the bento um, to kind of work through this difficult time. So definitely recommend any of those things. And now uh, I will open time for questions uh, and I am two minutes under time. So good job me. Um, so I'm gonna, and again, these are the questions that you can ask about networkism, generosity, coherent pluralism, and bentoism. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm going to look at my um, questions from the audience from folks. So there are a lot of delicious, good questions here. Um, so let's start with this one from Grace. Grace says, given that the media and sense-making tools are biased towards corporate buying and censorship by who, how do we reach the ideals that are presented here? Mm, that's a good question, Grace. So I think what um, Grace is asking is, hey, we have this media that's biased towards, uh, that has all these weird incentives, um, and how do we actually reach these ideas? I, um, so I think that this is, difficult. And I think that the, I guess what I would say is, yeah, no matter what, we're going to have these interesting incentives where um, uh, there's this awkward incentive where even though on the internet, you can create an idea and then um, send those bits around the world, copy them infinity times and send them around the world, all for zero marginal cost. That's cool. Um, but you actually have to have a business model behind it. So you can't just, um, that's all free, but you also need to make money. And so how do you do that? 
I don't think we've solved this yet. I think that we're essentially at V1 or V2 in a lot of our network sense making protocols. We have something like Google, which is great. Um, and PageRank is a great underlying protocol here. But um, there's a lot of ways where Google does not do its best um, or something like Facebook or you know, our current form of the feed. Do you really think that those are actually gonna be our final forms? I don't think so. Um, so I think that, so we'll see what more experimentation looks like here. In general, I'd recommend folks to build protocols and not platforms, aka try to think about the underlying, um, uh, the, the underlying protocol of what we want to build, um, these underlying kind of uh, sense-making protocols, and then use that to, and, 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 and kind of build it in the open source way and think about money later. That's my, my slight recommendation. I do also want to say another thing here. You talk about censorship. I think censorship is, um, there are, so the way that I would think about this is you have a, actually, let me bring up this piece of mine from the past. Um, so it is called, oh, this is interesting. Oh, I got it. Um, uh, there's this idea, actually, this is worth pulling up, uh, defining abundance uh, and trust. Um, So the idea here is that um, what we want to do is um, people have this idea that, oh, we must have free speech on the internet and the internet is this permissionless protocol um, and you should have the, your access to free speech as much as you want. Um, and that's generally true and the internet's awesome at that, but you have the right to free speech, but you don't have the right to free reach. Um, that's the crucial idea. That's from Rene Devrista. Just like you can't say fire in a crowded L in a crowded theater because um, it could have actual impacts on people. So too on the internet, should you not just be able to say say and reach everybody with whatever you want? Instead, you should take this what's called libertarian paternalism perspective, which says that okay, um, we can have this libertarianism, which is free speech and exit and things things like that, and we should have this paternal perspective, which says hey, we should be it's okay for us to kind of nudge our sense making environment towards more and more good information. I think it's totally okay if right now YouTube says, um, hey, things by the who are pretty good. And that if you have this other weird disinformation, that's probably not good. It's not perfect because the who is not perfect, but um, I think moving towards this more kind of um, paternalistic and censorship adjacent environment is actually okay. Okay, so that's the first question. The second question is from um, anonymous and actually let's go yeah let's do one anonymous one um how do you reconcile the us with people of opposing values and beliefs my future us may be directly opposite of your future us that's a great question um so anonymous's question is oh boy if different us's have these opposing values and beliefs how do you talk with people so this is difficult i think that the my underlying and, and this is a, like kind of a classic thing here is like, you know, in 2016, when a lot of perhaps my, you know, progressive liberal friends were, were demonizing, and I was demonizing to some extent, some more like Trump supporter types, there's also this, you really should push against that and say, wait, why are these folks like this? And you should try to be empathetic with people. Um, so that's, that's my over, my first take here is that you should really try to quote unquote, be curious first, and to try to make sure that you seek first to understand and then to be understood. Um, and so, yeah, try to understand what their values and beliefs actually are. That's that's step one, um, is getting an understanding of theirs. And also maybe even step zero is getting a, a clear view on your own values and beliefs. Um, and so I think that's crucial. And then once you do that, I think that finding um, some of these shared outcomes with people is a very powerful thing. So when you think about these other folks, you can say, okay, you have these shared, um, uh, you want, um, let's say something like, um, uh, police abolition, you know, defund the police versus keep the police people. Um, what they both agree on is the idea that um, they probably both, if you if you say, well, how do we, where do we agree? They probably both agree that safety is an important thing. They probably both agree that the conversation is an important conversation. So kind of searching for those shared agreements, I think is another crucial piece here. So those are my slight uh, uh, recommendations. Um, let me look at this one from Ed here, which says, um, Thanks, Reese. Do you have any suggestions for further reading on post-capitalism? Well, A, check out my piece, you know, reeslandmark.com. Um, I think that that's cool. Other things that are in the post-capitalist space, it's interesting. You have some, hmm, uh, so there's a bunch of 
good reading here. I think that they come in different forms. So if I were to think about my little, the four key parts of my thing, networkism, coherent pluralism, bentoism, and generosity, I think from a networkism perspective, you should look at someone like Ben Thompson. Um, he does amazing work on how these networks work in society. You should look in general at this kind of the world of um, uh, it's the, the world of STS. I forget what STS is called, but this it's an academic world. Um, you should think about yeah, look into the worlds of AI ethics and things like that to understand how networks work in society. Um, but really, Ben Thompson's trajectory is a great a great step. Um, I would say from a coherent pluralism perspective, the thing I would most recommend is oh boy, um, maybe the book um, by John Haidt called. Uh, uh, the Righteous Mind. I think that's a really good thing that shows how different, it, it looks at different morals in society and understands and tries to look at how to understand them. Um, from a Bentoism perspective, I recommend Yancey's book. And then from a generosity perspective, I recommend looking at effective altruism. Um, so those are kind of the four big buckets. But capitalism is interesting because, interesting because there's not much, um, uh, there's not many topics, there's not much writing on it yet. Um, and so it's not a clear thing. Um, and it also gets conflated with with ideas of I think a lot of the post capitalist folks I agree with, but I also disagree with. I think a lot of them are maybe too anti market. Um, they're kind of you know socialist Marxist types, which I'm into a lot of those things. But but I think that you'll see a lot of if you Google post capitalism, you'll see a lot of like socialist thought. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, from Mulongo, I hope you just said your name right. Um, in the longest sense, what a fantastic session. Thank you. Um, as a global South citizen who mostly lives in, who's lived mostly in the global North, how do we move global South societies to post-capitalism when capitalism hasn't worked? Mm. Um, yeah, so A, I don't know that much about uh, global Southy things and, and how these things work. I'm mostly inclined by this, um, the view that we should, uh, by the quote unquote ladder up perspective, by the quote unquote strong state libertarian perspective, by the quote unquote, um, you know, Singapore and China miracle perspectives, where you really just try to make a strong state that encourages local domestic markets by putting like tariffs on things, um, on, on imports, and you try to build up uh, local markets in this beautiful way and try to produce growth within your society. I don't know that much about it though. Um, so that's my initial uh, question or answer. I hope that helps. Sorry, it wasn't that great. Um, from Harith, uh, they say, was with more local decentralized institutions, how do groups coordinate for self-defense against an external party that centralizes resources for violence? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so Harith's question gets into something that my framework doesn't touch on, but it's actually pretty crucial, which is that a big part of the, our industrial age and why um, this why capitalism combined with nation states succeeded so well is because um, nation states were able to have um, essentially increased returns on um, on uh, scale and they the more essentially like something like the United States because they were able to and they had a monopoly on violence and so what that allowed for is allow them to both take new land like go into the American West and take land from you know indigenous folks in Mexico and whoever um, and use that land to then uh, push it through factories to make goods um, and it also allowed them to have this monopoly on violence which allowed for kind of liberalism as a thing to exist with like um, this social contract between individuals and the state and the rule of law and, and individual rights and stuff like that and private property. Um, and so, yeah, how should violence work in this new decentralized world? Oof, I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to this question. I know some folks think about things like security as a service. Um, I don't, but I'm not sure about that. I think but my my macro hope here, and this is, and really the scary thing with all this stuff is that there is a, um, we're going through, this is a big transition for society. Um, you know, it's no small thing. The internet is no small thing. And the end of the industrial age and the beginning of the knowledge age is no small thing. So it's gonna be kind of revolutionary, but also hopefully evolutionary. Um, and I really just hope that as we do this transition that we can get more people to level up on this, has the hierarchy of needs and into um, bentoism such that they um, don't hurt others. It's, you know, hurt people, hurt people. If you're hurt, you hurt others. But if you're not hurt and your needs are met, you won't hurt others. So that's, that's my macro hope here and hope we can get there. Um, the final question, final or last, yeah, final question. I have one more minute. So the final question here is from Simon. Um, 
Simon says, uh, are you familiar with James Carr's finite versus infinite games? I find it to be a useful metaphor as well to incorporate the belief of generosity and abundance. Yes, I, uh, Simon, I am familiar with James Carr's finite versus infinite games. And for listeners who don't know it, A, that's a great book to recommend. Um, the idea is that um, instead of playing these finite games, which is a game that you're trying to win, um, it's a win, it has a win-lose dynamic where it's like, oh, I'm going to beat you as a corporation. Um, I'm going to win and you're going to lose and then I'm going to make all your money. And since you think from an infinite game perspective where your goal is, is, is not to win the game, but just to keep on playing. Um, it's a, you're trying to make these win-win outcomes. And so if you start to think from this perspective, you start to see these games all around you and you start to say, wait a second, why are we competing in this way, when in fact we have the shared outcome, we both want this thing, let's start to collaborate on this, let's play this infinite game where we can both win and where society can win as well. Um, and so I think that's a very helpful perspective um, to bring on this. So with that, again, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for doing uh, all the logistics on the back end, folks. Thank you for coming to the, the show, other folks who are watching, and I hope you all have a good night or a good morning wherever you are. Okay, goodbye.